There were once two property owners who decided to rent their house. They weren't ready to sell yet, and they'd heard that becoming a landlord was a great way to build wealth and improve their financial future. After all, how hard could it really be? Six months later, the honeymoon was over. One month, they stopped receiving rent from their tenant, and because they were sympathetic, one month turned into two, and two months turned into three. And all the while, of course, they were still making their mortgage payment while they didn't receive any rent. Finally, it went on too long and they had to file an eviction to stop the financial bleeding. And when they eventually got the house back, they found out there were thousands of dollars in needed repairs and cleanup. And of course, all the while during all this time, they were still paying the mortgage. I'd like to say that I've never been one of the property owners in that story, but unfortunately I have. Since then, however, I've rented properties to hundreds of tenants and I've learned that this awful story does not have to be the norm. In fact, there are many amazing tenants who will pay on time and treat the home like their own. So what's the secret to a positive rental experience? Even if you're new, you can't just guess what works and fly by the seat of your pants. You've gotta get educated and treat renting your house like a business. To help you do that, in this video, I'm going to share seven tips to help you rent your house, even if it's your first time. If we haven't met yet, my name is Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this channel is all about investing in real estate and achieving financial independence so that you have more time to do what matters. In my case, that means traveling with my family, volunteering in my local town of Clemson, South Carolina, and making videos just like this to share with you. The first tip I wanna share with you is to ask yourself the question, is renting my house really a good idea? I'm gonna start off by trying to talk you out of it by giving you some reasons why it might not be a good idea to rent your house. Renting your house out might not be a good idea if your personal temperament isn't right to be a landlord. Now I wanna say up front, being a rental owner can be a very part-time job that you can do from anywhere in the world. In fact, I traveled for 17 months with my family living in Ecuador while we own rental properties back in the United States. And I would often spend 30 minutes to maybe a few hours a week virtually, maybe talking to the property manager, sending some money to a contractor, things like that, but a very part-time job. But if you're stressed out thinking about the house, thinking about what might happen to it, if there's some problems, even if somebody else is solving them, that just make you stressed, it might not be the right fit for you. There are other ways to make money. So that's one thing to think about. Another is, is your house the right property for a rental property? For me, an ideal rental property is a simple house. It's not something that's a huge 3,000 square foot luxury house. So if you have a big house like that, there's a lot of things that can break. The maintenance might turnover might be a lot more. And so a nice simple house is typically the best rental property. Or if the house is really, really old and needs a whole lot of repairs and you can't afford to do those repairs, Renting it out to somebody with a property that needs all that work is also not a good idea. Finally, renting your house out might not be a good idea if the cash flow doesn't make sense on that property. I did a whole another video on how to calculate the cash flow for a rental property, and I included a free spreadsheet that you can use to run the numbers for yourself. I highly recommend you check that out and ask yourself the question, is this house that I have going to make sense? Am I gonna have to be feeding it cash flow every month? We call that an alligator in the rental property business or is it at least gonna break even or pay, even pay me a little bit of money, which is a much more positive experience. The other thing I'll say about cash is that if you're getting into a business, you wanna make sure you have some reserves for your rental property. I like to have at least $5,000 for every property, at least early on in my business, just in case the heating and air breaks, just in case I have some kind of rainy day emergency. I like to have that much just sitting in the bank. Sometimes Some people also use about three months of their rent in order just to put that in reserves. Either way, you need to have a little bit of cash in the bank as a cushion and you need to make sure your property works financially for you that is feeding you cash and not taking it away from you every month. Now, if you've made it through those reasons you should not rent your house and you're still interested, let me share a few reasons you should rent your house, some positives. And one of the biggest ones is that real estate investing is an amazing vehicle to build wealth and to build income that can help you achieve your future financial goals. That's what this channel is all about. And if you are someone who just lived in your home and now you're considering renting it out, this can actually be a great decision because the financing you have in place, getting your financing for an investment property is one of the most challenging parts of this business. And if you already have financing in place, like a 30 year fixed low interest mortgage, you can keep that financing even if you move out and you rent your house out. So that can be a great way to get started and kind of get your foot in the door as a real estate investor. And if you've ever considered moving back into that house, my wife and I have done this with one rental property we have. We think one of these days we might move back into it, but in the meantime, we're renting it out. 
So this is an asset that's very flexible. You can move into it, you can use it, in addition to turning it into an investment. The second tip I wanna share with you to help you rent out your house is to research the rental rate of your property. Now, a lot of new investors, when they first start getting ready to rent their house, they begin like this. They get their mortgage payment, they add up all of their expenses, and they say, you know what? I need to rent my property for this much in order to cover all of my expenses. That's actually backwards. That's the wrong way to approach it because the people in the market, the people who are gonna rent your house out, don't care what your expenses are. They only care what's available on the market. So they're just like appraising your house and figuring out what your house is worth to resell it. There's also a market rate for what your property is worth to rent it. And so the question is, how do you figure that out? And I wanna share a few different ways. The first is there's some free tools out there that you can use. I like using the rental property manager tool and also the Bigger Pockets tool. Bigger Pockets is a great online forum. They actually publish my book, Retire Early with Real Estate. So you can go, I'll have links to both of those free tools in the video description. You can check those out in order to put your address in the, of the property and to estimate what your property could rent for. Another, a little bit better tool is there are some paid tools with some pretty low cost in order to get reports on your property with not only what the rent rate is, but also what the vacancy rate is in the area, how many properties are available. It gives you a little bit more detailed report. There's a couple out there. One's called Rentometer and another one is called Avail. And I'm gonna talk more about Avail here in the rest of this video. They're a online property management solution. So if you're a small landlord who wants to collect rent, who wants to do tenant screening, Avail is a tool that does all that. But they also have a paid tool where you can get a rental property report. So you can check that out. And I'll have links to both of those as well. And then a third way, maybe even a foolproof way, one of the most accurate way that I have found is to use a property manager. So if you are gonna be renting the property out and hiring a property manager to do it, these property managers often have the best pulse on what's really going on with the market. They have hundreds of properties that they're renting out and they're collecting rent on those at any given time. And so they can be very accurate typically, understanding how long it took to rent the last property, how comparable it is to yours. And so you can ask them to give you an estimate of what your property will rent for. So the final tip there is once you know what your property is gonna rent for, be sure to put it on the market at a price that's a little bit below what the full market rent is. Because remember the story, you wanna find the best tenants, the quality tenants, who are gonna stay in your property and pay on time. And if you're just a little bit below the full market value, you're gonna give yourself the best chance to get a lot of applicants and, and pick the right tenant. If you're, if you're pricing it above what the real market rent is, just as a wishful thinking, that you're not necessar necessarily going to attract the best tenants. The third tip I wanna share with you to rent your house is to actually prepare your house to be a good rental property. Now remember the story we talked about, how you wanna attract the best tenants who will pay on time and who will stay a long time and to take care of your house. Well, in order to attract quality tenants, you have to have a quality property. And that really starts with the cosmetics of the property. And you can, don't have to make this the best house, you know, the most luxurious house ever, but you do want it to be neat. You want it to be attractive. You want it especially to be clean. And so very clean and neat. When somebody comes and looks at it, they want to live there. They feel like it's home. This is their home. And so cosmetically making it attractive is important. But on the, on the other side of that, as a landlord, if you're gonna be renting this property out, you want it to be very low maintenance. There's some properties that are beautiful that are very high maintenance. And I talked about that earlier, the bigger properties or the ones with lots of roof lines, things like that aren't necessarily the best rental properties. So if you can do repairs that make your property low maintenance, that could be great. So things like in the flooring in your property, having a lot of carpet, not as attractive for a rental property, having more tile or luxury vinyl tile or hardwood floors, hard surfaces that could be used over and over again without getting stained or dirty or having to be replaced is a big deal. So floor surfaces, countertops, the exterior of the property. This might not be something easy to fix, but I love properties that have masonry like brick or stone or something like that, or maybe a metal or vinyl on the outside instead of wood that you have to paint every three, four or five years. So there's a lot of other things like that, but make sure your property is, is attractive and low maintenance, and those will help you out when you're renting your property. So beyond just preparing the house to rent, there's also a couple other things you wanna prepare as a landlord. And one of those is insurance. So if you lived in the property before, you probably had an owner-occupant homeowner's insurance policy. We actually have to get a different policy in order to rent your property out. You can call your insurance agent and most of the time they also have a what's called a landlord policy. And there's just a different type of policy that covers different risks for being a landlord. And there's usually a liability policy in, in addition to a policy that helps you in case the property uh, got burned down by fire, had some other natural disaster. And so ask your insurance agent to get a proper uh, policy. The other thing you wanna do is check in your local town for any kind of regulations related to rental properties. 
So your local zoning and codes enforcement people, you can call them up or you can look on the website to find out if there's a licensing requirement for your town. My town in Clemson, South Carolina has a licensing requirement, or there might be some other regulations that you have to follow as a landlord, either on the local level or the state level. So definitely you wanna find those out. And if it's too uh, complicated for you to find out, ask your local attorney. Having a real estate attorney can help you out, figure out what you need to do as a landlord. The fourth tip I have for you to help you rent your house out is to create a plan to market and show your property. So all these other steps have been building up to the point now when you're finally gonna put your property out on the market. And so the first tip I have is to get the word out. So we're in a digital age, and so promoting your property, marketing your property these days is mainly happens online, although you could also do some signs at the house to have a for rent sign with your phone number and maybe a website on there. But digital is typically the way I do it these days, and there are a lot of tools out there. There are free tools like Zillow, Realtor.com, Apartments.com, all sorts of other websites. I like to use kind of a shortcut there, is there the, these online property management softwares I mentioned. There's a lot of them out there. I mentioned one that I'm recommending these days called Avail.co. Co. And if you upload your pictures and your videos and you have really good looking pictures, that's important these days because people are virtually deciding whether they like your house or not. You have good pictures and the house looks great, the video looks great. You can then upload them to a tool like Avail. And then for free, you can press a button and it'll syndicate to a lot of different online websites that tenants are looking for. So I found if you price the property correctly, if you have great photos and videos, a good description of the property, and you upload it and get it out to the right websites, you will have more leads than you can handle from good tenants. And so that's step number one, promote it, get the word out. But then as you get all these leads in, you're gonna have to be organized with your process to get people to look at the property and to go to the next step. Because ultimately your goal here with this step is to have applications for people who wanna rent your property. And in many cases, they're gonna to wanna to look at the property if they're local. So they're gonna to wanna to go take a look at the property and have a showing. So how do you do that? Do you drive all the way over town to show your house every single time that somebody wants to look at it? I recommend that you don't do that. I recommend, especially if somebody's living there, you wanna have two or three open houses during the week. So I try to do one on the evening on a weekday, maybe one on a, on a Saturday morning or sometime on Sunday afternoon. So that might, that might be give you different times of the week when people are available and just have an hour window, you show up, you tell everybody who's interested to show up at the same time as well. And then instead of you meeting one person and then they don't show up, I've been there and done that, you are allowing a lot of people to get there at one time to look at it. it kind of creates more of an auction mentality. They know that there's other people looking at it, so that also benefits you. And it also is just more efficient on your time. But again, the ultimate goal of this step is to attract people who want to fill out applications. And so if you have a tool like avail.co or some of the other online softwares, you have an application in that tool and then you can send them a link to the application so that they can fill out their information. And I'll talk about more about that next. The fifth tip I have for you is to screen well to find the most qualified tenant for your property. Now you remember my original story, someone moved into the house, they tore it up, they didn't pay their rent and it cost a lot of money and a lot of heartache. I found that you can avoid 99.9% of those situations if you just have a thorough process up front to screen for qualified tenants. Now what that practically means is that sometimes you might leave a property vacant longer if you don't find a qualified person instead of just putting the first person into the property. That's a mistake I made early in my career. Now how do you judge whether someone is qualified or not? The first thing I wanna say, this is not discrimination. There are federal laws, there's local laws. There's also just common decency that you don't discriminate based on race, religion, sex, disability status, and a list of other things that you can check out if you Google fair housing laws in the United States. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is making sure someone can financially afford the property and also make sure have they proven in the past that they can pay other people on time. That's what the application process is all about. So I strongly suggest that you create a written list of tenant screening criteria for yourself that you can use to say yes or no to people who are looking at your property. And to get you started on that, or just to share an example, I'm gonna share my own written tenant screening criteria that you can get for free. If you look in the video description below, I have a link and you can just put your email address in there and I'll send you a copy of my criteria. The other thing I wanna say about that though is that every state's a little bit different in terms of what's allowed and what's not allowed. I'm in the state of South Carolina, so definitely do your due diligence in your own state. So once you have these written tenant screening criteria, you can begin evaluating the applications that come in for your property. Now, how do you evaluate them? When, a, when someone fills out an application, like I referenced before on avail.co or other websites, you can then do a credit and background check and the tenant typically pays for those anywhere from 25, I think to $50 per adult. 
and you'll get a report that has a credit score, has their information that they filled out on their income. It often has eviction reports on whether they've been evicted or not. And so there's a lot of details on there that you can use, again, to compare to your own criteria on your list of written tenant screening criteria. So the process ends by choosing one person who you're gonna to allow to rent your property. So you're gonna approve them, and then you're gonna to have to give a written notice to the other people on why they were not chosen. Either you chose someone else who was more qualified, or maybe they didn't meet your criteria. So that's the end of the screening process. And then we go to another tip. So you've been through the prior steps of preparing yourself, preparing the property, of marketing it, and now you found a tenant who meets your qualifications. The next step, my tip number six, is that you have a meeting with your tenant before you start talking about moving in. Now this is a meeting where several things happen, but most importantly, you get on the same page and put your expectations out for the tenant, and they're able to put their expectations out and understand who's responsible for what and what all the details are of this landlord-tenant relationship. Now, a lot of those details are laid out in a lease agreement or a rental agreement, and every state has different requirements and different types of leases. One of the reasons I love this tool I've talked about today, avail.co, they have a built-in lease tool where depending on your state, you can just fill out information from your application and it'll kind of auto-populate, and then you have a lease that they can sign virtually. So that's one tool, but there's other tools out there, and you can also always suggest that you talk to your local attorney to review your leases, to make sure it meets your criteria, that it makes sure it meets the local laws of your state. So you're gonna, in this meeting, you're gonna go over that lease, take your time, go through it step by step to make sure they understand it, to make sure they're on the same page with that. You also want to receive the security deposit and the first month's rent. And if you're meeting in person, getting that in certified funds, either a money order or a cashier's check to make sure that the money's clear so you can deposit it in the bank. Or if you're doing it virtually through avail.co or some other online tool, just make sure you give it a few days, whatever amount of time it takes to make sure that check clears from the bank. So my final tip, tip number seven, is to make the move-in process as pleasant and as easy as possible for your tenant and also for you. So there's a practical side of this. This is the point in the process where you turn over the property to your tenant. So you're gonna give the keys to them somehow, and that might be just meeting them in person and handing it to them. I often leave a lockbox at the property and just put the keys in the lockbox. You can get a lockbox from a Lowe's or a Home Depot or a hardware store. So you just leave it out at the property, that way you're not having to sit there and wait to meet people. I like to just get it done. Uh, but you give them the keys so they can move into the property. But there's an important step you wanna do before that, which is take a video and take uh, photographs of both the interior and the exterior of the property and also get a move-in condition checklist either done by your tenant alone they can just turn it into you after a week or you can do a walkthrough with them and the point of this is that you've gotten a security deposit up front and when they move out of the property whenever that is a year or two or three down the road you want to make sure you're all on the same page about what the condition was up front and without these videos without this move-in checklist it can be very contentious and it can be i said this they said this and so it just makes it easier, makes it more fair and reasonable for everybody involved. So be sure to do that before the move-in process. Beyond the practical side of move-in, there's some other things you can get creative with just to make it a better experience for your tenant. So think about when you move into or go into a hotel room or a nice Airbnb, there's always some little touches that make it even more pleasant and make you want to stay there longer, make you want to refer friends to them. And so we used to do things like have gifts when the tenant moved in, just small things, not necessarily huge, um, but we would have college students, so we'd leave some chocolate, we would leave some little kitchen utensils because they might not always have that, and then also just leave a list of resources that would be helpful for them for them living in that property. Is there a trail nearby that they can walk on? Is there a grocery store they need to know about? Is there a different uh, process that you need to use to take the trash out? So all these practical steps that help them make it an easier transition, makes them enjoy living there, makes them wanna stay longer, makes them hopefully wanna refer people to you even when they move out. So you've chosen the right tenant, you've got them moved in, you've got your first muscle rent, all is good for now. And of course, this is just the beginning of the next part of your landlording process where you have to manage the property, collect rent. I'll plan on doing more videos in the future. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions about this particular process, if you have any suggestions for future videos related to landlording, related to renting properties. And I think you'll like my next video, which is gonna be at the end screen here and in the video uh, description below, where I talk about what happens one of these days when you decide to sell your rental property. What does that look like from a tax standpoint? Point, what all the numbers look like. So be sure to check that video out. And if you like this video, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like and the thumbs up button to help me spread the word on YouTube. And if you like this channel, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the little bell so you don't miss anything. I have new podcasts that come out every Monday morning. I have new videos just like this that come out every Friday. 
You've been watching Coach Carson TV. My name is Chad Carson. You can call me Coach, and this is a channel all about investing in real estate, achieving financial independence, and doing more of what matters. See you next time.